Dean Joshua offers us this call to worship from the writings of Julia Escobar, the great Guatemalan poet, Christian theologian, and human rights activist. This is from her poem, They Have Threatened Us With Resurrection. It isn't the noise in the streets that keeps us from resting, my friend, nor is it the shouts of the young people coming out drunk from St. Paul's Bar on their way to the mountains, there is something here within us which doesn't let us sleep, which doesn't let us rest, which doesn't stop pounding deep inside. It is the silent, warm weeping of Indian women without their husbands. It is the sad gaze of the children fixed there beyond memory in the very pupil of our eyes, which during sleep, though closed, keep watch with each contraction of the heart in every awakening. Now six of them have left us, and nine, and Rob be it all, and two, plus two, plus two, and ten, a hundred, a thousand, a whole army, witness to our pain, our fear, our courage, our hope. What keeps us from sleeping is that they have threatened us with resurrection. Because at each nightfall, though exhausted from the endless inventory of killings since 1954, yet we continue to love life and do not accept their death. They have threatened us with resurrection because we have felt their inner bodies and their souls penetrated ours doub doubly fortified. Because in this marathon of hope, there are always others to relieve us in bearing the courage necessary to arrive at the goal which lies beyond death. They have threatened us with resurrection because they will not be able to wrest from us their bodies, their souls, their strength, their spirit, and even their death, and least of all, their life. Because they live today, tomorrow, and always on the streets, baptized with their blood, and in the air which gathered up their cry, in the jungle that hid their shadows, in the river that gathered up their laughter, in the ocean that holds their secrets, in the craters of the volcanoes, pyramids of the new day which swallowed up their ashes. They have threatened us with resurrection because they are more alive than ever before, because they transform our agony and fertilize our struggle, because they pick us up when we fall and gird us like giants before the fear of those demented gorillas. They have threatened us with resurrection because they do not know life. Poor things. That is the whirlwind which does not let us sleep. We keep watch and awake we dream. No, it is not the street noises, nor the shouts from the drunks in St. Patrick's Bar, nor the noise from the fans at the ballpark. It is the internal cyclone of a kaleidoscopic struggle which will heal that wound of the Quetzal fallen in Ixcon. It is the earthquake soon to come that will shake the world and put everything in its place. No, brother and sister, 
It's not the noise in the streets which does not let us sleep. Accompany us then on this vigil and you will know what it is to dream. You will then know how marvelous it is to live threatened with resurrection, to dream awake, to keep watch while asleep, to live while dying, and to already know oneself resurrected. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Webster and I am the liturgist today. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to our worship service at First Congregational Church of Walla Walla. And it's a privilege too for me to be welcoming our guest preacher for the day, the Reverend Kazi Joshua, Dean of Students at Whitman College. Dean Joshua is a longtime close friend and minister to our faith community and he is here with us today with a message in the absence of our pastor Nathaniel, who is on vacation. Thank you, Kazi. Again, welcome everyone to joining our service today in whatever way you're able to do that. Blessings upon you, for you are friends. You who are weary of oppression and seek to cast your eyes upward you who are buoyed by privilege and seek to bring others to the surface of justice, you are affected in ways you haven't yet identified. You who question or who are confused, you who are writers, educators, poets, and scholars, you who have been dragged here by others, you who have dreamed of visiting, you are friends, you are welcome. May this be a place of blessed conversation, of dismantling of old systems and building of new. May you teach and may you transgress. May you have words you thought you could not say and hear those you never imagined you could tolerate. May you live and be formed by this sacred community, curious, candid, courageous and constructive. As you speak your truth and hear others, may you be blessed by this place and may this place be a blessing. And now if you are able, would you join me please in our statement of identity? We at First Congregational Church of Walla Walla are a congregation of diverse Christian believers empowered by love and guided by the Holy Spirit. It is our mission to enable personal spiritual growth, collective outreach to the community, and stewardship of God's creation. We are an open and affirming church. Because of who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Our first scripture reading is from the Christian New Testament, chapter 4 of the book of the Acts of the Apostle, 
I'm reading here from the English translation, The Message. The whole congregation of believers were united as one, one heart, one mind. They didn't even claim ownership of their own possessions. No one said, that's mine, you can't have it. They shared everything. The apostles gave powerful witness to the resurrection of the Master Jesus, and grace was on all of them. And so it turned out that not a person among them was needy. Those who owned fields or houses sold them and brought the price of the sale to the apostles and made an offering of it. The apostles then distributed it according to each person's need. May our hearts be blessed by this reading. We've just come out of celebrating the Easter season and we are now connected Ash Wednesday through Holy Week and the resurrection. As we look back, we accept this as the unfolding of the Christian year. But in the moment of the unfolding of the resurrection, from the point of view of those who were around Jesus, it was in the shadow of a state-sanctioned murder of their teacher and friend that they had to figure out what are we going to do now. This is where we are now picking up the story as we read in Acts 4 verses 32 to 35. In verse 32 it says they were of one heart and one soul. In the middle of the uncertainty, the terror that they felt, they were together as one. Recall here the words of Jesus in another part of the gospel. I pray that they may be one so that the world may know that you sent me. In some ways, the prayer under difficult circumstances was being answered in this moment of our reading. As we continue in the reading, we hear that no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was shared in common. This particular outcome came out of the unity they felt together as they were under this moment of siege and the discipleship that they had experienced together. You will recall that the life of the disciples and indeed the life of Jesus was one of itinerance. They traveled together and they often ate together. So the concept of sharing was one that was, as it were, baked into the experience of the disciples. You recall that some of the notable miracles were of food, fish, and wine all around sharing among those who believed so that none had any need. Here, there was a new kind of miracle from their shared experience of following in the footsteps of Jesus. They were gathered with one heart and one mind, and the next part of the scriptures teaches us that they therefore shared everything. It was a logical outcome of their experience together. So let's pause for a moment and consider what is happening here. Like us, the group of disciples had been in communion with the teacher, and the teacher was now gone. They were drawn to each other instead of being pulled apart. In these moments of both political, cultural, and racial polarization and physical distancing, the temptation is to be separated from the call of who we are. To use the words of Martin Luther King in describing that community, he called it the beloved community. No wonder 
Jesus prayed for us that we might be one because he understood that there would be moments of dissension and the tearing apart of our common community fabric. Let us consider what we have just talked about. The believers had a shared experience. They had journeyed with Jesus and they shared the life and death and resurrection of the Savior. At the same time, they were able to share what they had in common because their bonds were so strong. How are our bonds today? Are they strong? Do we walk together in a shared experience? Do we experience the death, life, and resurrection beyond this moment of post-Easter as one that binds us together, even when there are forces that try to tear us apart? The scripture then says, out of this, with great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. The community derived its power from the oneness and their sharing together, from their generosity to one another, from those among them who had need. They had an unwavering testimony that the Lord had indeed risen. This resulted in a new social and economic arrangement as this small band of believers that was under siege was transformed. The scripture says they experienced great grace. It is my prayer today that we might experience such great grace and that the testimony that we might give together might be as strong as theirs. Yes, these who stood in the shadow of the resurrection. Even though our own times may appear to be radically different from these times, we do have some things to share in common. In the words of Paul the Apostle, we share one Lord, one baptism, one faith. Because of the spirit that enveloped the community, coming out the situation of great upheaval, there was no one among them who had any need of anything. There was great grace, and here they bore witness to a possibility of a new creation. May we be renewed every day as we consider the resurrected Christ in this period beyond the resurrection. Our next scripture reading is from the Christian Testament, the Gospel of John. This is the story of the Apostle Thomas the Doubter. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them and said, peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples seeing the master with their own eyes were awestruck. Jesus repeated his greeting, peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them. When Jesus came, the other disciples told him, we saw the master. But he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, 
his disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, My master, my God. Jesus said, So you believe because you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. May you be blessed by this reading. In some ways, this second portion of scripture comes before the one we just talked about in Acts 4, verses 32 to 35. And so we have the readings a little bit out of order. This was the first day of the week. So let us say this is a kind of Monday after Easter. The believers were in a kind of lockdown, right? Very much unlike the present one under COVID. They were under lockdown because they were afraid. The scripture says they were afraid of the Jews. I want to pause here for a moment to clarify that the people we are talking about were all Jewish, right? So I do not want any mistaken anti-Semitism to seep into this particular reading. Here it is referring to a particular class of religious leaders, the keeper of the tradition who had condemned and indeed handed over uh, Jesus to be tried and to be crucified. And so I do not want us to make an error of reading modern anti-Semitism into the gospel. We know the first believers were Jewish and those that were around Jesus. In any case, the doors were locked. They sought security from the harm that they believed they could experience because they were afraid. It makes total sense. This movement that had been burgeoning, that had been gathering crowds, had suddenly been reduced to a small band of hardcore believers with a founder, a teacher, that had since been executed. Sometimes when we are buffeted by the winds and the storms of life, we too want to hide. We too want to be in lockdown. We too want to be protected from the tribulations of the present moment. It was in that feeling, it was in that lockdown situation, it was in that situation of fear that Jesus comes in their midst and gives the following words. Peace be with you. Shalom, a special kind of greeting. This is... As we read elsewhere, the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that cannot be accounted for in the middle of great difficulty. Why is Jesus giving this greeting at this time? What were the disciples feeling? They were terrified. They were in a situation in which the reports of the resurrection were still a matter of great debate, even among them. 
And Jesus brings them in the middle of that, the tidings of peace. When perhaps it was the scariest moment for the believers. I don't know what your situation is. Are you troubled? Are you weary? Are you afraid? Are you unsure of what is going to happen now? When you get up in the morning, when you go to work, when you go shopping, do you wonder how this present health crisis called the pandemic is going to end as we hear of many different variants in spite of the miracle of the vaccine? Jesus, in that situation, speaks these words of peace. Hold on to the blessing of the words of Jesus. Because Jesus stands in our situation today. Jesus prays for us. He speaks this blessing because he understood that the disciples were wondering what the future held for them in the absence of the master. Remember, they were in a situation of lockdown. And Jesus offers this prayer, if you will. Jesus offers this prophecy. Jesus offers this invocation. Jesus offers this proclamation to those who were gathered. We might wonder, when Jesus gave the greeting, was Jesus proclaiming the reality as it was, or was he proclaiming the reality in faith as he would like it to be? Was it a way of lifting up the believers so that they understood that something greater was among them than they felt? Was it a way of lifting their spirits? As the teaching in Hebrews 11 verse 1, and this is a different translation, it says, Now faith is the turning of dreams into deeds. It may be very well that the disciples were in this diff difficult situ situation. There could have been no need for Jesus to bless them if he did not understand that they were troubled. But even when they did not feel the impact of the blessing in that moment, still the words of Jesus proceeded and they received them. Peace be with you. Because we know that faith is the substance of things not seen. We know, according to Hebrews 11, that Abraham walked in faith with God and it was considered unto him righteousness, that he believed the promises of God. We are called today to believe, even in these times, the promises of God. Whatever your situation, God is able. Receive the words of Jesus. Resist the temptation not to believe the post-resurrection Jesus. The power of the words of Jesus filled the room. And it says the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Are you seeing the Lord in your situation? Do you see Jesus? This is no ordinary seeing. It is a complex comprehension of a situation that has got implications beyond what you can see with your eyes. It is like Stephen in the book of Acts being stoned by Paul and others for his testimony to Jesus. And as he was about to die, he lifted his eyes into heaven and he said the following words, I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. That's the seeing that we are talking about. It's a different kind of seeing. It was the same kind of seeing as the two disciples who walked on the road to Emmaus with Jesus after the resurrection and did not recognize them until they sat down. And when he broke bread, their eyes were opened 
and they recognized him and their hearts were warm. I pray today that our eyes in whatever situation may be opened so that we might see Jesus like Stephen and like the believers who walk with Jesus to Emmaus. Jesus says it again. Peace be with you and offers them a commission. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. This is the great commission. There is a song that says, So send I you to labor unrewarded, unloved and known, so send I you. No servant is greater than the master who sends him forth, and our calling is not always uh, roses and chocolates. Our calling sometimes is that of difficulty, but that is the following of the master. And even in that case, Jesus is saying, peace, I am with you and I'm sending you in the same way that God has sent me. And so there's a proclamation of peace to those who are gathered. There is a commission that sends us forth into the world to proclaim the resurrection and to live in a certain kind of way that testifies to what God can do. Jesus says, I'm sending you into the world and that whoever you receive will also be received and that if you forgive, others will be forgiven as well. And so let's receive this commission. Let us not be like Jonah who tried to flee to Nineveh when he was called to go elsewhere because he was afraid. Jesus equips them with the Holy Spirit to offer them a new beginning, a kind of renewal to allow them to live in a new moment and not to allow the past be a shadow on the present or the future. It is as we are taught in the book of Revelation, behold, I make all things new. He calls the disciples and the church and all of us in this moment after the resurrection to a time of continuous renewal and the transformation of ourselves and the world we're a part of. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Receive the Holy Spirit. This is our commission to proclaim and to leave the beloved community, to be the beloved community. But the story is still unfolding. Thomas was not there. This was one of the believers. One might wonder, where was Thomas? What was he doing? He was not among them. And when the believers came and told them that Jesus had come, he doubted, he hesitated, he raised a question about whether they had indeed seen Jesus. Thomas was not there. And yet, in spite of his absence, as a witness, or perhaps because of his absence, he doubted when they had told him, we had seen the Lord. Now, remember, to say that they had seen the Lord who had been resurrected, who had been um, um, crucified three days ago, was not a small claim. And yet, the disciples say, we had seen him. So, Thomas insists on a kind of condition of faith, unless I put my hands in his ribs, I will not believe. That's what I call a qualified faith. 
What kind of faith do you have? Is it the faith of Thomas? Or is it the faith of the disciples? Or is it the faith that moves mountains? Faith that actually matters. A week passed by. It could be a month. It could be a year. It could be a season. And the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. They were again in lockdown. Jesus again appears and comes and gives them the same blessing. And says, peace. And he turns to Thomas. He has a deep dialogue with Thomas. He gave him the evidence that he needed. Put your hand here and feel my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Jesus still understands that it is possible to touch him and not believe. So he adds, do not doubt, but believe. He knows it is possible to be in the church and still doubt. Jesus is speaking to us not to be doubtful, to believe the testimony of others, to be indeed a community of faith. Don't be prisoners of doubt. Consider belief. Thomas is without words except to say, my Lord, my Lord. Is Thomas in this moment born again? Is this our moment? What is this? Is it a confession? Is it a regret? Is it a prayer? What is it that we are called to in this moment to respond to this Jesus who appears again? Suddenly, the eloquence that Thomas had was reduced to this anguished cry. Jesus continues with his teaching. Have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have believed although they have not seen. First Congregational Church, have you believed? Why have you believed? This is Jesus, you're wrapping it up for us. That we should later understand and without feeling the sights of Jesus still believe. In the end, the gospel concludes, while there's a long record of what Jesus had done what has been written here is to lead us to believe that Jesus was Messiah and that in so doing, we could live lives that are transformed. We are called, therefore, First Congregational Church Walla Walla, in this post-resurrection moment to continue to hold on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That doubts may be a temptation and disappointing may follow us, but the words of Jesus are clear. Do not doubt, believe, just as the Father has sent me, so send I you. To proclaim liberty to the captives, healing to those who are afflicted, release to those who are bound, sight to the blind, and life to those whose lives are oppressed. Believing in our brother Jesus, to be part of this renewed community of solidarity in which we are of one mind, one voice, one witness, one faith, and in our proclamation and in our experience, share great grace and joy in this ongoing movement of resurrection, renewal, as we go towards Pentecost. May God add a blessing to the preaching of the Holy Word.
the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Dear amazing God, Father and Mother, the creator of all humanity and sustainer of the earth, show your holy light in the universe. Release your greatness and spread your love into the world. Show your love through us. Help us to cherish and respect each other. Protect us, support us, and forgive our wrongdoings. Strengthen us from doing them again. Help us to forgive ourselves and others and give us strength to protect those in need. Keep us safe. Help us to make the right decisions in life. Give us the opportunity to heal the people of the world. You are the greatest. You are the supreme creator of all. You are the almighty. Amen. The benediction. Go to the community. Live among the community members. Learn from them. Work with them. Start with what the community has and build upon what it possesses. Teach by showing. Learn by doing. Not a showcase, but a pattern. Not odds and ends, but a system. Not to conform, but to transform. Not relief, but release. Proclaiming the peace of the resurrected Christ always and everywhere. Amen.